Keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Friend, go up higher. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Beautiful, isn't it, how that last hymn reflected our gospel so well, especially in its final verse. There are two things I want to point out with you at the start here regarding some words that may be unfamiliar or unfamiliarly used. The first is in our collect, the word prevent. Uh, Whoops. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong page. Yes, Lord, we pray thee that thy grace may always prevent and follow us. The word prevent in its 16th century meaning had to do with going before, going in front of, preventing. Uh, And as you know, the way we use it now is almost the opposite. It's the thing in front of you that prevents you from going forward, that keeps you from going forward. This is something that is going to continue to move so that you don't stumble over it. And that is exactly what we ask God to do, that his grace would go before us to prepare the way. The other is a familiar word, but somewhat mysterious. It's the word Jehovah. You've all seen that. You've seen it in various locations. You've seen a denomination that calls itself Jehovah's Witnesses. But where does that word come from? It's a bit of an interesting story, so if you don't mind, I'm going to regale you with it briefly. In the Hebrew Bible, there is a mysterious name of God or word for God. Uh, Josephus, the great uh, Hellenistic Jewish general and traitor of the first century who went over to the Romans during the first Jewish war, and therefore survived and got the chance to write a history of the Jewish people, tells us that this sacred and secret name of God could only be pronounced out loud by the high priest in the precincts of the temple on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. The people would bow and he would say the holy name. We do not know how it was pronounced. Uh, Hebrew, ancient, and modern is written without any vowels. It is all consonants all the time. So we do not exactly know how the word should have been vocalized. And in the Hebrew, it is the letters yud, he, vav, he. So y, v, h, yud, he. I'm sorry. Y, v, v. (laughs) You can figure it out. Yud he vav he, y h v h, and in German the y of course is a j, and the tradition of vocalizing that name in print comes from early nineteenth century German scholars. Uh, they, they came up with the vocalization Jehovah. You will also see in more modern versions. Yahweh. Those are attempts at vocalizing a word that we don't actually know how to pronounce. The King James Version, in a more reverent spirit, picked up the rabbinic Jewish tradition of not attempting to say that name at all, but pronouncing it every time it appears in the text as Adonai, which is the word for Lord. So whenever you are reading the King James Bible and you see the word Lord, by this time it has been, you know, printing has come about by the time of the King James Version, and they came up with a printing convention to show when the sacred name was being used. That's when the word Lord appears in all capitals. So if the word is Lord in all capitals in your King James, it is the Tetragrammaton, the four-letter sacred name of God. And if it's not in all capital letters, it's actually the word Adonai, spelled out. 
There we have Jehovah and prevent. The Lord has a table. He has a table in heaven, a true table of which this altar here, the sacred table, is but an image, an image of the true table, the true altar of sacrifice and the true table of meal fellowship in heaven. And the first place at that table is taken by God the Son, who sits down at the right hand of the Father in heaven as soon as he ascends on the Feast of the Ascension. He ascends and brings with him into the heavenly realms our human flesh, humanness, the createdness of creation. He brings it with him somehow into a realm that is outside of both time and space. But in a sense, his ascending with his mother's flesh, human flesh that is ours, his ascending into heaven in that being brings heaven closer to us. As he goes up, heaven comes a little closer to mankind. And he leaves behind him, when he ascends, a group of fellows, the apostles and other disciples who have with each other table fellowship, a simple meal. In the Old Covenant, the meal was the Passover lamb sacrificed at Passover. At that meal, that fateful year before Christ was betrayed and put to death for our sins, he told his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. And what had he done? He had blessed the bread. He had blessed the wine in the same way that was always done at a Passover meal or any other meal. For to praise God and to bless him is the way of asking his blessing upon us. But Jesus did something else. In taking the bread and taking the wine and saying of them, this is my body, this is my blood, do this in remembrance of me, our Lord gave to his early church a mystery, something profound that took many, many years to work out and understand in as much as we are capable of understanding this great mystery. And remember, it is a mystery. We have formulae for describing it. We have words to make it somewhat more clear, but ultimately, they enable us only to approach closer to it, never to get at the core of it. When you are called to communion and you come to the rail, you are coming closer by nearness of approach to the image of the divine table. And as Christ's servant, his ministers come down to you, and there is that meeting in miniature between heaven and earth in table fellowship. You go up, we come down, and there is a sharing of bread and wine that is the body and blood of Christ, our spiritual food which does what in us if we let it, it is an objective reality. We are subjectively powerful. You can stop God from helping you. Did you know that? You can stop him from helping you. You can refuse to cooperate. You can do what Satan did and said, I come first. It's all about me. Never mind. We can do that. He lets us. That's part of the freedom that is 
so inherent in love. But we come in faith forward to receive, and we receive what? The one body, the outward and visible sign of the one spirit. We share in that moment in remembrance of the one baptism that unites us all in the one body that is Christ's body. And we remember from coming forward to this table fellowship what Christ said in our gospel today. When you are bid to a feast, take the lowest place. That way you can be called up higher. And God is always desiring to call us up to him. And coming to the feast is your experience of that in this world. We humble ourselves and let others take the higher place wherever that metaphor might apply to our conduct in the world. Give place. Let someone else come to the head of the line. Let others get what they need before you get what you need. Why? Because right here, you have already received everything that you need because you have got Christ. You have got God incarnate inside of you, working in you to make you whole in the one body. You are inside that sacred and unpronounceable name. You receive on your tongue, Lord, Adonai incarnate, dwell in that, abide with him. And when it comes to it, take the lowest place, for he will call you up higher. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.